Hi, everyone. Hi. Happy Saturday. So as people are coming in, I wanted to invite, hi, Nkosi, it's good to see you. My co-host, we take turns. Um, so yeah, I, so in the chat, I would like to invite you as an icebreaker to share something that you've done recently that helped you feel fresh or refreshed. What's something that you've done recently that has helped you feel fresh or refreshed? You can put it in the chat. Our friends on Facebook can just think it to themselves because I can't see their chat. <laughs> So oh, taking long naps in the afternoon. Yes. Yeah, there's nothing like a day yes, that has time for a nap in it. Putting my feet in my daughter's kiddie pool. Yes. I unplugged my drug. I said, no, I am intrigued, Gail. <laughs> cool. I um, Something that I've been doing recently that I'm going to share is that, have any of you heard of the show Heartstopper? based on um, web comics and they become a couple of graphic novels. Um, the first chunk like season was released on Netflix and I watched it in late April and I've watched an episode of it literally every night since. So there's um, eight episodes. I watch one a night and then two on Saturdays because episode seven, there's some bullying that happens and then episode eight, it ends happily. I'm not, I'm not really spoiling anything, I don't think. Um, maybe I was, sorry. but. That makes me feel refreshed before bed. It like cleans my brain. And then I can read some regular pages and then go to bed. Yes, Kayla, yes. Yeah, it's so good. Okay. Um, so welcome to the June edition of the So Fresh reading series. I'm so happy to be with you tonight. And um, I'm gonna just say some things and then we are gonna dive in. So we are sponsored by the fabulous Get Fresh Books. Get Fresh Books is a cooperative press and a 501c3 tax exempt organization where poets, editors, and the publisher create and pursue a vision for the writer's book. Get Fresh Books does not charge submission fees or run contests. If you are a poet and you're working on a manuscript, please submit it. The press's chief concern is to provide opportunities for underrepresented voices in publishing. We reject all the isms and phobias suppressing our voices or trying to suppress our voices. Say no to racism, sexism, ageism, gender identity discrimination, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, economic disenfranchisement, all of it. Get Fresh Books wants manuscripts from people of color, LGBTQIA plus people, people living with disabilities and people living with mental illnesses. You can become a friend of the press with a one-time or monthly donation on our website. I say our website, it's the Royal R. I'm not, you know, um, the Royal We. You can also support us by telling people about the press. So follow on social media, share the posts, spread the good word. I'm your host, Darla Himmelis. Um, I have published a chat book called Flesh Enough and a full length called Cleave, both with Get Fresh Books. And they can't get rid of me now. I just, you know, I'm in love and I'm here forever. So we are also joined, um, the account that says Roberto Garcia is actually Kayla, Kayla Oliveira, who is Get Fresh Books' readings and events coordinator and marketing intern. Kayla is keeping our Zoom, Zoom bomber free and um, just running it for us. So thank you, Kayla. We have two wonderful readers tonight, poets Andrea Deacon and Angela Narciso Torres. They will each read for about 15 minutes and then we'll have a little time for Q&A. So please feel free to light up the chat with your responses to their work and then think of some questions you might want to ask during the q and I would love to pull some questions from the chat. So with no further ado, we are going to start with Andrea Deacon. So Andrea Deacon was born in rural Missouri. Her writing has appeared in Beltway Poetry Quarterly, Beyond Queer Words, The Blue Mountain Review, Spoon River Poetry Review, Valley Voices, and elsewhere. Her awards include an honorable mention in the 2019 Spoon River Poetry Review Editor's Prize Contest 
and second place in the 2020 Blue Mountain Review LGBTQ chapbook contest, among others. Her debut chapbook, Mother Kingdom, won the 2021 Slappering Hole Press Chapbook Competition and was a finalist in the Poetry Chapbook category of the 2022 International Book Awards. A former book editor, she has worked for the Multnomah County Library for 15 years. She lives in Portland, Oregon with her wife and daughter. Let's welcome Andrea, yay. Thank you, thanks Starla. Thank you to everybody that get fresh books. Um, I'm really honored to be here. I'm really honored to be reading with Angela and to be sharing space with all of you. Um, so I thought I would read some poems from my chapbook, Mother Kingdom that Darla mentioned. It just came out in March. I'm kind of in disbelief that it even exists. <laughs> um, and it is it is um, a product of Slapring Hall Press's really wonderful chapbook contest that they actually just closed um, about a week ago for this year. So I would encourage all poets who don't have um, a full length out yet or even a chapbook um, to enter because it's a great contest and they're just wonderful people. So, um, and so the chapbook is about, um, it's about motherhood, but it's also about um, motherhood and kind of not necessarily a traditional sense. Um, one second, I forgot to set my timer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's kind of about being a mother to yourself. Um, it's about queerness. Um, it's about generational trauma. So, you know, let, very light topics. But um, I think I, I thought I would start with a poem um, to start off called Evolution, um, which takes place, the setting is kind of um, where I grew up along this riverbank on the Osage River in Missouri. I lived there when I was a young child. And even though I've lived in Portland for about 20 years, which is um, interesting to think about, I've lived now in Portland the same amount of time I've lived in Missouri. Um, which is interesting. Um, I still come back to that place in a lot of my poems because I think there's something about the place you grew up when you're a kid, it just kind of stays with you. Um, and so in this poem, uh, my father is looking for arrowheads, which is something that he often did when I was young. Um, we lived in a, like a remodeled cabin and nearby was this field that would get plowed um, in the spring and fall. And then that was sort of the prime time to look for them. So this one's called Evolution. Was it when I followed my father to the fields, his back hunched, searching for arrowheads, my feet sinking in the newly turned earth? Or was it seeing my mother from the doorway, her back a waning crescent in the dark? Words came easily to me then, alone with paper, my mind a sweet shadow, time a blanket around my shoulders. But coming out my mouth, they choked and stumbled. My face, the crushed color of cherries, stuck to the bottom of a boot. When I told my father I was gay, he was chopping radishes, their red skins half moons on the cutting board, little gleams of white like a promise worth keeping. His careful hands slicing, their rough wintered edges that held so many things, dogs, babies, stones the color of starlight, my wild heart beating the night's calm rhythm. What can I fix you to eat? My mother was not so easy, her face pinched pale in the thick dark of her bedroom, thin covers, a moat of righteous limbs, and I, the only sinner. Even now, all these years later, my heart closes when I hear her voice. Today it's cold, but the crocuses are coming up. Ochre, pollen, petals, small as thimbles. Soon the geese will head back north, their black wings cutting through soundless cloud. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my next poem is called First Kill. So a little bit of background on this one is that I grew up an only child for until I was about 13. But then when um, I was that age, my parents got divorced. And then my father remarried about a year later. Um, and my new stepmom had six kids. So immediately at age 14, I got six siblings. I got three brothers and three sisters. 
um, which was wild because I wasn't quite sure. I mean, I was 14 anyway, so that's a, an interesting time. So one of my new um, siblings was also 14. And not only that, he was born the same month that I was. And not only that, he was born the same week that I was. So um, in this poem, which is called First Kill, we have just come upon a deer stand out in the woods uh, with my father. So this is First Kill. On the inside, the deer stand was surprisingly small. White bucket in the corner, wet sawdust and piss. The thrill of being alone with him, this new brother I had gotten just weeks before by way of a second marriage, four days apart, the two of us, born the same month and year. My father had taken us hunting. Anything could happen. I don't know who saw it first, but soon it was in our hands as we stood side by side, holding the magazine, curling at the edges, all those women and our eyes on them like magnets. When my father returned with a doe, calling and calling our names, we scampered down the steps, guilty children, our minds already on dinner. Years would pass before I knew the soft rumblings in my body could begin to speak its impossible language. But in the deer stand, the crickets were loud in my ears. The humid air stuck to my skin as I carefully turned the pages. My new brother, just inches from my molting body, its pimpled cheeks and long coltish legs, our heads bowed as if in prayer. That night, we dined like kings. Thank you. Um, let's see, the next one, that, so the next one's kind of about being a parent. I have a daughter who um, is eight. She will be nine in about three weeks. I think eight um, has been my favorite age of all the ages so far because she's like just fully herself. Um, she told me yesterday she wants to be a stand-up comedian when she's older and she wants to play kids' birthday parties as her job. And she asked me for a ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> and I'm just like so into it. I'm like, yes, let's do this. Um, but when she was about six, she was really obsessed with rocks. And we had read this book around that time about a kid who went on a hike and um, collected all these rocks on the hike. And then as it came time to go back to their car, they, they had too many rocks to bring back with them and it was too heavy for their backpack. So they left this like little stack of rocks. Um, so in, in this poem, we are looking for rocks near this, at this river near our house uh, called the Columbia River in Portland. And uh, it is not going kind of as she planned it. <laughs> so this one's called, we carry stones with seasons inside them. Newly six, my daughter fills her fists with rocks to stack from the bruised edge of the Columbia, just north of our house in the city. She squints and stomps like a displeased general. Everything has gone wrong. The wind and water stretch around us, a large lumbering animal rubbing its eyes. It will be fall in a few weeks. Mama, they are too small, she says, not flat enough for the fierce towers in her mind. Her legs blur as she charges ahead. Soon she is on to the next item of business, but I'm left searching. How much she starts that I take on as my own, what motherhood is, the push and pull of waves at the shore. I pocket those that call to me, mostly smooth ones giving me a kind of peace, probably the closest thing to prayer I've ever felt, river rock to skin. We walk to the top of the boat ramp, jagged concrete ridges reminding me of the time when I was seven or eight and played hide and seek with the summer people 
a half mile from our house on the Osage. I don't remember if I was it when I fell, slicing my knee on those steep steps, blood caught in the grooves. I looked for a boat full of people, coolers and catfish, tackle hanging off the sides. Instead, there was only murky water, bloated, bloated bugs and old beer cans, my blood. Someone's cousin carried me all the way running toward our cabin at the end of the tree-lined gravel. Windows dark, the dogs barking. It's bad, you're gonna need stitches. My sweaty hands held his neck. Already shrinking into myself, I shrugged it off. A summer blossom closing at dusk. At the hospital, they gave me six stitches. The boy had been right. It was my body, and I was the last to know. Thank you. Um, let's see. My next poem feels very kind of timely in light of everything that's happening in the Supreme Court. Um, it's called Borscht, and it is about a time when my wife and I were trying to grow our family and deciding if we should do, if we should do that or not. Um, and while we were waiting for that uh, answer, I, I was making soup for two sisters that I knew, one who had just had a baby and one who had chosen not to have a baby. And I think at the heart of this poem is just the knowledge that it is up to only a woman to decide what happens to her body and no one else. Um, so this one is called Borscht. The morning I thought I'd be a mother again, I made soup for two sisters, one with a new baby bright as a beet, the other with an empty womb. Both left sleeping in twin beds, two tired uteruses kneading the same soup I'd eaten years before when my own daughter was born. Soup so red, it stained the stove. Its sharp stock simmering all day. Beets, beef, viscous pork. At 39, I'm surprised to learn I've reached the stage of death, watching it in mirrored hallways, seeing its shadow on my father's face. Friends, when we meet for coffee, talk only of the body, how a mother's morning walk turned into terrible brain blossoms, fat sirens spinning, a lover's stomach taken by tumors, thin lips sucking lime popsicles. It's been a year since I waited, a year since I named the bundle of cells I swore I could see growing into someone I had met before. And when the blood did come, it was as if proof of sins were smeared on my broken body, rendered visible by time's tired ink. You still ask for a brother, but it gets fuzzier each time, as if we are speaking underwater. I research dogs. I set up a fish tank and bury them one by one under the same front pine, glinting tails winking out into the black dirt cold faded starlight. I still see the sisters, but I don't make borscht anymore. So many ways to be a mother, even to oneself. When I tuck you in at night among the mountain of stuffed animals, lovingly arranged, you say, tell me a story about when you were a kid. You want all of me, even in sleep, but how to tell you my fear I've run out of stories, my mind already failing, as if my body is trying to protect me from something it cannot name. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I think I have time for one more. Um, I have my last one is called My Worry. Um, worry is something that I've basically like inherited from my mom's side of the family, my matriarchal line. Um, and I, I feel that most acutely, I think, as a parent, um, 
those of you with kids maybe have heard that quote about like when you have a child it's like your heart is forever outside of your body so i feel that the most acutely when i'm at the ocean with her so this last one it's called my worry and it's my last poem thank you so much um okay let's see if i can find it My worry is a yarn ball tangled under the bed, is broken glass beneath my tires as I'm biking home, is a piece of popcorn I've been working all day stuck between a pocket of tooth and gum. My worry is a wave watching me walk the shore, collecting stones and shells while my daughter runs ahead. From here, she is so small, I can fit her whole body between two fingers. My worry takes root beneath my very house, is there when the shit comes spilling out of the toilet as I'm taking a shower. My worry is a friend I see on the street walking home. I raise my hand in greeting, but she does not see me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. When you talked about researching dogs, we had a great view of yours behind you. It was so cute. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Angela Narciso Torres is the author of What Happens is Neither, Four Way Books 2021, Blood Orange, winner of the 2013 Willow Books Literature Award for Poetry, and the chapbook To the Bone, Sundress Publications 2020. Recent work appears or is forthcoming in Poetry, Prairie Schooner, and Poetry Northwest. A graduate of Warren Wilson MFA program for writers and Harvard Graduate School of Education, Angela has received fellowships from Breadloaf Writers Conference, Illinois Arts Council, and Ragdale Foundation. She received the Yates Poetry Prize from the W.B. Yates Society of New York and was named one of Chicago's Lit 50, who, real, who Really Books in Chicago by New City Magazine. Born in Brooklyn and raised in Manila, she currently resides in San Diego. She ser serves as a senior editor and reviews editor for Rhino Poetry. Please join me in welcoming Angela. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, thank you to all the good people at Get Fresh Books, especially Roberto for inviting me and Darla for hosting this event so graciously. Uh, thank you, Kayla, for supporting this Zoom event and Andrea for that brilliant reading. I just love the tenderness and the fierceness of your poems and how imagistically and narratively rich your, your poems um, from that new chapbook are. And I, I can't wait to get a copy of it. Um, thank you to all of you out there in the ether who have joined us and are spending part of their precious Saturday hours with us. I will be reading um, maybe three poems from my book, uh, What Happens is Neither. Uh, the book is a, an homage and an el elegy to my parents whom I lost um, three years ago uh, this month, 11 days apart from each other. And um, although the book is about that particular devastating loss, it is also about how to reinvent the self in the face of such loss um, and how to deal with all kinds of losses because it, loss really is the precondition of being human being, a human being. Um, what I didn't know when I was writing this book uh, and it came out in 2021 uh, was that it would also teach me how to deal with uh, the, the losses that we faced with the, the couple of years in the pandemic where there was illness, there was so much suffering and losses um, on a global level that, that really affected each and every one of us. Um, to, say the, to say nothing of the, the losses we also felt um, uh, in our own circle of family and friends. I'll be starting with a poem in this book about a different kind of loss. And this is for a baby that I miscarried at five weeks in between my first and second son, who are now both taller than me and are in their twenties. Um, a loss that I still feel very deeply despite how early in the pregnancy it happened and you know, decades ago. Um, and I, I still remember how, 
frustrating it was to not have control over how my body um, handled this pregnancy and um, the spontaneous ending of it. And I'm reading it now also because of its relevance to the current Supreme Court ruling and as a way of saying that I stand with all women whose ability to exert control over their bodies and their choices is now se severely limited by this ruling. This poem is for them and really for all of us, to the one we lost. Child, when the blue black sack of you dropped a yoke of matted cells and plasma into the toilet's bone white walls, I blamed the rain, the fried eggplant, the trip to the mall, blamed my past selfish ways, faulted the oak that fell across the fence. While you sailed off, my second, my spawn, little prawn I'd never met. Peaceful, you floated from your watery cave to the salty grottos of the sea, where perhaps a spiny anemone caught you, its tentacles a coral bed your cradle, and the manatee moaned a mournful song. Um, I just got back from a, a quick visit to Chicago when Darla asked, what have you done lady that's refreshed you? It was just seeing my friends this past um, few days and reconnecting with writers um, who I work with at Rhino Poetry, one of whom is in the audience, Naoko Fujimoto, hello. Um, she and I walked around the city. It was so nice to reconnect with, the, with Chicago, the sites and the people who, who I feel all helped me birth my first book, Blood Orange, which was published while I was living there. Um, in one of our walks, we stood in front of the water tower and Naoko did a little video of me reading this self-portrait of water that I wrote and is in this book. Um, and I'd like to share it because um, like I said, this is about, this book is also about reinvention and there are a couple of self-portraits in this book because we're always reinventing ourselves. Self-portrait as water. Why does the body feel more beautiful underwater? Is what goes through me when I break the glass surface. Levels rising as I plumb the tub's white womb, this second skin thinner, slicker, gleaming wet as a lacquered bowl. Because the simplest of molecules, two H's, one O, love to love each other, cling to what they touch. How this universal solvent swallows every hill, fills the hollows of my surrender. Most forgiving of substances, I resolve to live like you, to fill and be filled, to take the shape of my vessel, dispensing heat, displacing matter, lighter than air. Um, I'd like to read one more poem from the book before I turn to some new work. Um, the book is, um, like I said, has is was occasioned by the the passing of my parents, but I really started writing the poems early on when my mother was first diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And so I re was really quite prepared, though one is never prepared when she passed because I felt we were losing her a little bit every year since she was diagnosed. And this is a poem that I, I wrote in the early stages of her diagnosis. It's called, What I Learned This Week. What I learned this week. No more flop, sorry, I'll start again. No more fireflies in Northern Indiana. The fish in Lake Erie are dying out because they're ingesting plastic microbeads used in exfoliants. Yellow X's mark trees on our street that workers will ax next week. Ash borers are eating them alive so they cannot absorb water or light. This week I learned my mother is losing dexterity in both hands. But when I play box Ave Maria on the piano, she lifts her head, motions me to move her wheelchair closer. She leans over the keyboard to try the melody, finding the notes each time. Her fingers can barely strike the keys, but I hear them. Some say music memory is the last to go. 
Still, I have no windfalls for the empty baskets of my mother's eyes. When I returned from Manila, the peonies I'd left in half blossom were stunted by spring storms. A bud that will not bloom is called a bullet. Thank you. So on to some new, newer work. Um, after my parents died and during the pandemic, it was really difficult for me to write for some reason. I, I felt like I was at a loss for words, which rarely happens, especially, and is terrifying, especially for a writer. But um, what I found was useful was, was finding containers for this grief. And though I had written the book, I felt there was still so much to mine in that strange country of mourning and grieving. And so this next poem is a sonnet. Excuse me, I'll just take a drink of water. <coughs> um, a sonnet is a, a tight form <coughs> that, that provides you with rules and restrictions that allow you to contain <coughs> vast and difficult emotions. And I found that this was really useful in my case. Um, this is called, This Grief, a Stone Baked into Parched Earth. This Grief, a Stone Baked into Parched Earth. It rains for days, the clay will not relent. This grief, like so many griefs, yet like no other. As dusk purples the sky with one palette, then paints the hills and plains another. We grow old with aches in our bones, faces mapping where we smiled or scowled too much. This was the year I did both or neither. And time was water filling a stranded boat. The dog's leg will heal or not. The rose encumbered with slugs bloom or not bloom. The cat hiss or purr. Night comes down with her tattered skirt. The sun will wake his face a knot or star. Things are always or never what they are. Um, I have one last poem. I don't know if I have time for it. I think I'll just try to read maybe, yeah, one last poem. This is really a section poem though, and it's um, written in the Tonka form. Another container I found really useful because it's only five lines and the syllabic count is 57577. And during the COVID uh, pandemic, I got COVID last October and it was a pretty serious case in the sense that I had to be quarantined for 10 days and I was feeling a lot of um, um, pulmonary symptoms and um, was really having trouble speaking but I did write and what really helped me was corresponding with a friend, another poet who might be in the audience. I think I see you there, Lucia. Um, we wrote each other Tonka daily and that really helped me to keep my creativity, my, my hands, my, my pen moving and keep my creative juices flowing even during such a terrifying time. This is called Days of a Thousand Weathers and Epistolary because Lucia and I were writing each other back and forth. So I'll be alternating between my poem and her poems and I only read five days worth. So not the 30 days that we had done this experiment. One, only the moon came over the hills, a good nurse in sensible shoes. My breath caught in the branches of my ribs. The only house I visit is you on the veranda collecting the mountains. Pale light breathes in color, blue dress, the red heart of your shawl. The form will come, but the day brings no guarantees except whole mending peace. In crevices, rosemary embraces mustard and spirits. One day I could finish sentences, the next, Today, a gray dove struts on the fence, unfolds its note to the wind. Milk white mi mist fringes the balcony, hands pressed to a chilled pane, to learn to speak quietly 
at such a distance to you. My nature is dust. Members of my clan, breadcrumbs rest in reunion. On the breakfast table, red jam configures the hours. To enter a garden of laws, the shyness of moss covering the ground yet holding its own. I close the gates. At dawn, my eyes are green. You miss the daily things you can't do, held by doors or days, little things, pruning roses, salting a stew, how the mailbox creaked open. This bed of roses, the sea, a truck, ashes, soil, lettuce, nails, the wrong side of, to make ones, to raise the, to climb out of, to put it to. Away from the house, the garden turns informal. A bird scratches the sky, its backbone reveals. I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lucia, for letting me share your, your part of the poems too. You have time, Angela. Do you want to do one more? Um, okay, I'll end with a, I'll end with the uh, title poem of the book. It's called What Happens Is Neither. Thank you. What happens is neither the end nor the beginning. Yet we're wired to look for signs. Consider the peonies. One makes a perfect bud after months of nothing. Another's leaves are ringed with deep rot. How can I not think end? How can I not say beginning? Leaves fall when days shorten because a tree must reduce to its tough parts, twig, branch, bark. My mother sleeps away the daylight. She nods off while chewing a spoonful of fish and rice, her head a peony gone to seed. Father calls to say she doesn't recognize him. Turning to him, she cried out, certain a stranger was in her bed. He played his violin till she slept, a leaf in late fall curling into itself. In autumn, chlorophyll disappears, canceling green from leaves so yellow and magenta can blaze. In my mirror, I see her, the smile that favors a cheek, eyes slanting in the shape of small fish we eat for breakfast. Trees know best than now of things. What goes on has been going on for centuries. Washing dishes, I rest a foot on my standing leg. A fork clangs on the tile. I rinse a cracked cup. I try not to think of endings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. I am just, I'm so moved by both of your readings. Your images are just like curled up inside me now. I feel like I, taken in so much from your poems. I was, thank I'm gonna, you. yes, thank you. Um, I wanna invite anyone who has a question for the poets to please put it in the chat. Um, we have some time for q and A. I I was really struck by how Andrea talked about your chat book being about in part mothering the self. And Angela, you talked about your work being about reinventing the self. Um, and both of those are really a kind of mothering, right? Um, and we're thinking, and your, your work talking about your own mother and then thinking about Roe versus Wade, I just began to have like, I became tearful listening um, and thinking about the layers of both of your work together tonight. Um, yes, what Gail said, such tender sheaths of living. Thank you. So I would love to hear just because I think we all could use, um, more hope and inspiration these days. If you could each share with us something that you have read or experienced recently, art, film, that has left you inspired, maybe has made you hungry to go create something of your own. Um, and either of you can go first. Well, honestly, I'm inspired right this moment. That last poem, I still have chills in my body. It was so beautiful. Just like <laughs> the peony and the leaf and, oh, wow. Um, 
I think I'm mostly also just inspired right now when I just get outside. I feel like if I get outside, I can get out, get out of my head a little bit. Um, but in terms of something I'm reading, I'm reading Ada Limon's new book, The Hurting Kind, and that's really beautiful. Um, I've also, I just got Victoria Chang, Chang's book. I might have it here actually, one second. Um, I haven't started it yet. It's called Dear Memory. And um, I have her book, Obit. That was so, so good. So I'm excited about this one, Letters on Writing, Silence and Grief. So I think I'm just, I'm kind of drawn to those topics right now, just in general. For me, I've been, I was inspired listening to you, Andrea, and how you made stories um, come to life in your poetry, stories that you take from your own life. And I was brought back to my first book. I feel like to some extent, all our first books are, someone told me our first books are our blood, sweat, and tears book. We write about, like you wrote about coming out to your dad and your mom and how different that was. Um, I My first book is about my childhood too, growing up in the Philippines and what was it like to leave that behind. Um, and and I, I've, I've moved past that first book because I was so encumbered with losing my parents that most of these poems here are about the here and now and the 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 rawness of that grief. But really in the end, you know, when I find myself at a loss for what to write, and it's been really a struggle to write these past few uh, months, um, I, more like a year and a half, um, we always have our stories. I think that Eudora Welty was the one who said that if you've lived to the age of 14, you have enough in you to write for the rest of your life. And that's why I want to thank you, Andrea, for writing so richly and beautifully about the people who populate your life, your childhood, your niece, your, you know, your, your brother, and those stories that stick with us and the places we return to when we feel lost or when we're, we're unmoored. I was telling some people at dinner that when I, when I feel um, uh, homesick, I inadvertently return to my childhood bedroom in the Philippines with the pink curtains and it's also vivid still. And I feel that we, we just have to go back. We have to reach back and mine those memories. Um, I feel akin to Andrea in that I, I, I do write a lot from memory. I feel like our memories are really what make, make us. And even though nature sometimes fails us, I love to walk in nature, but sometimes nature can be so bright and sunny and you're not feeling that way. Um, and yet language will always hold us. Language will always, uh, if we put our words into the mouth of language, it will always hold us no matter how deep or vast or difficult those feelings are. And preach, I just got chills again. I can't, I mean, thank you. Yes. Um, I was thinking about how you both in your lives, I mean, we're, we're poets wherever, we're poets doing the dishes, we're poets when we're taking a shower. Um, you and your lives both do acts, play roles in service of reading culture and literary culture. Andrea at the library, Angela at Rhino, and in both cases, I'm sure beyond both of those roles. I'm just curious if you could share a bit about how, how that um, feeds you or how it challenges you as a poet. Uh, well, I am really fortunate to be able to work with kids um, and that really feeds me just to get to see a kid get excited about a book. And I think um, because I, part of my job is to help kids find books, um, I can get very obsessed with like, even if they've moved on, I'm like, well, wait, they wanted this specific book about elephants and doing this thing, you know, that, that's a bad example, but like, I can just sort of go down a rabbit hole where I, I feel like it's so important for a young person to find the book they need, you know what I mean? Uh, and that's really inspiring to me. Um, and I think also just like being around books, I mean, I guess it makes sense that like for, for um, writers, like we wanna be around books, like just like musicians probably all work in record stores or, you know, spend time <laughs> with records. Um, and I think just being around books all the time um, is just really comforting to me and just being able to just, yeah, connect people to like the, the exact thing they need. I think it's a really, it's a really satisfying feeling for me too. And also just to be able to be uh, an ally for people, you know, if like, because sometimes there's this thing about um, my profession where 
the first question someone asks someone asks you is often not the question that they have. Sometimes that there is mostly with like teens or adults, you know, um, kids are just I want this, but um, like if it's a sensitive question, they have to sort of make sure that you are trustworthy. And I take that very seriously, you know, because some questions teens or adults have are very sensitive, you know, about in terms of like sexuality or anything, you know, so that's kind of I, I feel really honored to be in that position. What you said um, about the question not being the real question, I feel like is so true of the work of being a poet too, that you might go to the page thinking you need to write about X. And then what happens is that Y starts coming out and you're just like, oh, okay, I actually needed to write about this other thing. You know, that was just the doorway. Um, also something else that you said, oh, about connecting with resources. I think about Adrian Rich and the Dream of a Common Language talking about poetry being the drive to connect. Now it's also so much of our work is like connecting with others, connecting through words, right? Um, my printer is making a weird noise. Sorry about that in the background. But I find that really moving and a useful analogy for the work of also searching through language um, for a way to connect with memory, connect with others, connect with love or whatever source of strength that we need at that given time. Angela, I'll, I'll let you go. Right. Um, so for me, my work as an editor with Rhino has has really fed me in so many ways and levels. Um, I was just in Chicago, like I said, Rhino is a Chicago based magazine. And I met with the Rhino editors over lunch because a friend of ours is moving to California, one of the editors, and uh, we were there to give her a send off. We had other business to do, but the party was purely social. But Rhino typically in non-pandemic times would meet around the large table and we would read the poems aloud to each other that we were considering for the journal and then we would vote. And there was something about that shared space and hearing the poems in each other's voices that really brought the poem to life. I mean, you could feel it in your body, you could feel it in the air. And it really created a sense of camaraderie between us, not just as editors, but as people, as poets. And there was always food on the table that we could, um, share at the same time. It was really like a, a, a communion in a way. And um, some of these people are also my best readers and my, my, my best critics and have helped me um, bring a lot of my poems um, into publication. So I, I thank them for their heart as well as their wisdom. Um, I also feel like editing thousands and choosing from thousands and thousands of uh, poems every year for the journal is really humbling for me, um, like to keep trying, to keep pushing the envelope, to keep trying um, to, to break out of your comfort zone because people out there are doing it and trying and not, not just those that get published, but those, who, especially those who don't and whom we have to reject because it reminds me to keep trying and the trying alone is, is a worthy endeavor because it shows that you haven't given up, that language may be inadequate, but we still try anyway and we keep trying. Um, because poets, we're stubborn that way. We, we, we want to keep trying and we keep, want to keep pushing language too. Um, and I, I would say uh, the best thing I learned from Rhino is learning how to cut and to edit my poems. Inevitably, someone will say, she didn't need those first three lines or they didn't need the last four lines of the poem. So I always look at beginnings and endings and see, am I clearing my throat here? Or am I giving this poem two or three endings when this ending is sufficient? Or what's the best ending really? So yeah, so much to thank for in that community. Thank you. Yeah, it's such an important reminder of how life-giving poetry is, but also the community that supports it and the act of being in conversation with one another as poets, whether through an editor-submitter relationship or just at events like this where we get to hear each other. This Absolutely. to me is so life-giving. <laughs> You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, Zoom is life giving to me in this in, in this kind of a context. Even if we're not in the same room together, it feeds, feels oddly intimate to be seeing each other's workspaces, each other's books on the shelf. It's absolutely. Just, mm -hmm. I mean, we could not get to each other same day if we got in the cars right now, right? It's, it's right. kind of amazing. Um, yes. I want to invite people in the audience again. We have a couple minutes left. I would love to hear if you have any questions for either or both of our poets. Um, about their work or about something else that's on your mind as a writer or a reader.
gonna be comfortable with silence for a moment. Here we go. Okay, and cozy. Can you talk more, Angela, about your experiences writing the Tonkas? How did that month long practice offer a kind of healing for you during recovery? Great question. That is a great question. Thank you, Nkozi. I hope I said your name correctly, Nkozi. Um, well, um, writing the Tongas were just the perfect container for, 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 um, for, for how I was feeling during those days of isolation because um, counting syllables, five, seven, five, seven, seven, made it so that it wasn't so intimidating. Like all I need to get down is five syllables. What is that, two words, three words, and then seven, and then another five. So I really tried to stick to the syllabic count. Uh, and I know it's not a requirement anymore. Haiku and Tanka now in the English doesn't have to be, but I tried to stay within that just because concision is such a discipline. Trying to choose, whittle down to really what only has, what, what only has to be in the poem, nothing else, no chatter, was really a discipline. And um, it really helped me feel connected to my writer self when I felt so kind of, my well was so dry during those days. But also what helped was exchanging them with my friend Lucia, who every morning from Florida would send it. So early in the morning when I woke up, it's already noon in, 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 um, in Florida, her poem was there and then it would get my mind spinning. Also a daily practice, it, makes you see the world differently. You're making your coffee and you're like, there's a poem, or you look out the window and there's an image that could be in my poem. It gets you in that mindset of always looking for things that could make a poem. And truly our lives are filled with poetry. We just have to be open to it and aware and listening and looking. So yeah, I think that small form really forced me to look and to listen for, for the poems that were there and waiting to be written. I encourage you to try it. I bet you'll, you'd be great. <laughs> I feel inspired too. I, I, have, I have not tried Tonka in many years and I don't know why. I think this is an invitation to us all. Um, we have a couple other questions here. Um, Gail was wondering about metaphor to either or both of you. Um, that question metaphor in relation to what language holds. I'm also going to share a question by Elizabeth Katniss, and either of you can speak about metaphor or this one, which is what do you struggle with most as poets, craft or poet identity or, or something else? Well, sometimes I think um, I don't want to go for the obvious metaphor, um, but I don't think it's also something I consciously do. Um, I, I sometimes just think of images um, and especially if you are starting out with a setting in mind. Sometimes the images just, just sort of happen. Um, but I think I, what I really like is sort of unexpected metaphor, you know, um, thinking about sort of like the, in the last poem Angela read, just like connecting um, a leaf or um, a peony to a mother. I mean, that's beautiful. And I think that that makes you just feel something um, more powerfully than if you were just to convey it in a really sort of direct way. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question, but it's something I think about a lot, but I, I often find um, the most interesting images when I'm just trying not to overthink it or try too hard. Um, but I also do think that that comes back to what Angela is saying about the importance of editing, because I do, I, I, let, I wrote down what you said about, um, you know, am I just clearing my throat? And I think, or is, the, or is it the beginning? And I'm like, oh, I love that. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Because sometimes I think when I start a poem, it is like you're clearing your throat and you're like, wait, is that really where I want it to start? So I'm still kind of learning how to do all of that. I, in some ways I feel like you could edit a poem forever. Like, how do you even know when it's done? Like it could be forever, right? I don't know. <laughs> My teacher said it's, it's, it's all a draft until you die. <laughs> But I love what you said about the metaphor, Andrea. It made me think, I'll just share an anecdote because we're running out of time. It made me think of um, a, a two, two minute um, audience I had with Sharon Old. We all each got two minutes with her. And my question to her was, how do I find poems? What do I write about? And she said, take a walk and look at a flower and look at that flower and say to yourself, what in that flower is like something in my life? That simple. 
describe the flower as well as you can. And then after you've described it, what does it look like in your life? Sounds really simple, right? But if you, if you just kept doing that with things you encounter in your life, images, as Andrea was saying, the images that come to you, and then look, what is it, what is it that it's telling me about my life, then you'd never run out of things to say. Because as Seamus Heaney said in poems, small things, small things can bear the weight of anything. So true. Just paying attention. You know, I, I tell my students, just start paying attention with curiosity and the poems will come, you know? Um, with our last two minutes, there was a question about, about challenge or struggle. I'm gonna go back up to it. Um, what do you struggle with most as poets? Um, and that could, it's wide open. Maybe you each could give a gut answer on that. You know, where do you find struggle these days as a poet? Um, real quick, I think because I start with sort of my um, memory, uh, my, my main struggle is how my story intersects with people in my life and how to be mindful of their story. Uh, but it's also something that I'm trying to like get out of my head about and just try to be be confident to take up the space that I am taking up um, because I think when, I think Dorian Locke said once that um, she has a, a sort of a, a framework of like you always can write about people who have more power than you that's how she approaches it but if people have less power than you maybe don't write about them but I don't know it's, it's sort of like an interesting way of thinking about it. But I think that's something because so my poems are so narrative, I think about that with what I write about my daughter sometimes, you know, and how that will affect her or vice versa. Thank you. Angela, how about you? For me, what I struggle with is how to make it new, how to always be um, pushing, um, pushing out of your comfort zone, how to not keep imitating myself in the poems that I write especially now that I've, I've written my second book. It's like, what will I do for my third book? And I, I know I shouldn't be overthinking it, but I've tried things like writing centos and semi-centos because I feel like the collage, like bringing elements from other people and their wisdom really sparks something in me sometimes. It becomes a way of kind of putting your own thoughts in relief with someone else's and then coming out with a new truth that still carries their truth and your, yours as well. So yeah, that's what I'm playing with now is sem semi-centos and centos and forms. I've been really excited about looking at the old forms and seeing how I can make it new through that. Like looking at the container rather than the content and not thinking too hard about what the content should be. Just filling that container with whatever, you know, like you could be free, free writing and, and then putting that into a sonnet form or a pantoum and see where that leads and just trusting the process. So that's where my work is, is right now. Absolutely. Wow. That's so exciting. Thank you. I feel like my heart is so full. What a gift you both have been tonight to all of us. I'm so honored to have shared space with you and your words and your wisdom. Um, thank you both so much. Something that I felt happening and it was naturally is that we were not just talking about the folks in the chat and, and guests who came to support you both, but also all these other poets who are inspirations, right? We, we could sort of gathered this like a cento, a bouquet of other poets, um, other sources of life and inspiration. So thank you um, so, so much. And we will be back. I don't know our next date, you know, follow Get Fresh Books um, for updates. And please, if you have not yet, order Andrea's book, order Angela's book, support the poets. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you again to our poets tonight. Thank you, Darla, and thank you, Andrea. Thank you, and Cozy, and Kayla, wherever you are. <laughs> so, it was so nice to be here with you. I feel like we could do this all day, every day. I agree, <laughs> like, thank you. I, this was I wonderful. Yeah, just to have uh, yeah, chance. Yeah, I could seriously talk to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to everyone. Stay connected, wonderful. you know, the joy <laughs> of the internet and email. So everyone have a beautiful rest of your evening and be well. You too. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you.